My name is Mark Turnipolsky. I'm the director of the Neuromuscular and Neurometabolic Clinic at McMaster University. Uh, we see uh, about 2,000 patients a year who have uh, either muscle, nerve, or uh, neurometabolic disorders. And we um, do everything from diagnosis uh, to treatment and uh, genetic testing. Um, so now I'm going to do a neurological examination. Uh, many people are a little bit intimidated by the neurological examination, but it can be done in uh, less than five minutes. So I'm going to go through that now with Erin. Um, okay if I examine you now, Erin? Yes. Good. So if somebody had mental status issues, cognitive issues, we would go through a mental status exam, but uh, that's not uh, something that comes up with uh, the majority of our muscle diseases. So we're going to start with the cranial nerves, uh, and then from there we'll move on to the motor examination, reflexes, and the sensory exam, and then we'll uh, look at gait. Okay. So what we're going to do is uh, just take a look first and you can see that there's no ptosis. Um, some disorders like OPMD, myasthenia, there can be ptosis. Now what I'm going to do is uh, just put my hand into here, now move over, look up, down, and we're moving in an H, up and down. Uh, you didn't see double through any of that, did you? No, not at all. No. So we didn't see any ophthalmoparesis nor did you report any diplopia, certainly things like uh, OPMD. Um, we see ptosis, but not ophthalmoparesis. With um, uh, things like mitochondrial disease, there can be ophthalmoparesis, uh, or things like myasthenia gravis. Now we're going to take a look at the eyes, and this doesn't need to be too onerous with the ophthalmoscope. Uh, first, what we do is just take a look at the pupillary response, so just look straight ahead. And they're nice and symmetric, going from about 4 millimeters to 2. And now we're going to take a look at uh, cataracts and fundi, and this can be done very quickly. First, when you look at cataracts, usually you put it on green 7 on the scope. And if I can get you just to sit straight, look straight ahead. I'm just going to touch your shoulder here, so it's right eye to right eye. Look off into the distance. And then usually if you go in and out with around green 7, if there's cataracts, you'll see them come into view. But we didn't see anything there, so there's no cataracts. We can see cataracts in certain things like mitochondrial disease. Uh, we can see this in different types of um, muscular dystrophy, such as myotonic dystrophy type 1 and type 2. So I'm just going to touch your shoulder, left eye to left eye, looking straight ahead, and in and back, no cataracts. And then to look at the fundi, put it on 2 and look straight ahead. And we can see the optic nerve and the back of the eye. No retinitis pigmentosa, everything looks good. Things like mitochondrial disease, uh, we can see optic atrophy and other things. If you don't feel comfortable doing this exam, that's fine, but if someone has visual symptoms, refer them to ophthalmology. Just look straight ahead. And the disc looks good, and there's no retinitis pigmentosa, so we'll put that away. Any swallowing issues at all? No. None whatsoever. So if she did have swallowing issues, we would take a look at the throat. So just using your otoscope, open up your mouth. Big ah. Uh. And you can see that her palate moves symmetric. And just listening to the voice is part of the examination. Patients who have uh, weakness at the back of the throat, uh, such as OPMD or myasthenia, will often have a nasal voice. And uh, Aaron doesn't have any issues like that. So we'll move on to the motor examination. The main thing is to check the bulk, the tone, and the strength. Um, so looking first of all at the bulk, have you lost any muscle mass anywhere? Like if as many muscles shrunk? No. So you don't feel that anything's uh, gotten thin in, in anything? Okay. Uh, and again, um, we would uh, just uh, take a look to see if there's any atrophy of the calf muscles, uh, which she does not have. Other calf here, there's no asymmetry. Uh, calves can be enlarged in some of the muscular dystrophy, such as Becker's or limb girdle dystrophy. So we see no uh, changes in her muscle bulk. We'll take a quick look at tone. So if I can just get you to relax, that's good. And her tone is nice and normal. So with upper motor neuron findings, we'd get a, a catch and release if it's a corticospinal tract issue. If there's basal ganglia issues, there'll be stiffness in the tone, um, which we can see in kids who are floppy and hypotonic with muscle disease. We call that hypotonia, which is a form of weakness. Now we're going to take a look at the proximal muscles. If you can hold your arms up, push up. 
And uh, you're trying hard there, right? Yeah, trying yeah. hard. There was no pain involved? No pain at all. Okay, so painless weakness is real weakness. Sometimes if people have a shoulder problem, it'll appear that they're weak, and that's more due to the pain. So there is definitely some weakness there that we can see, Aaron. Can you hold your arms like this? Pull your arms up. Okay, all right, and a little bit of weakness there, and push down. Okay, that felt weak too, eh? A little bit, yeah. Good, so it's arm flexion and extension, and she has a little bit of weakness. The weakness is graded uh, from essentially zero to five. Zero means there's no contraction at all. One is a flicker of contraction. Two would mean that you can uh, contract the muscle, but you have to eliminate gravity. So for example, she was able to pull up and give me some resistance, but if she was very weak, and we put her arm like this, now try and bring your arm in, good. So if she couldn't bring the arm up like this, but could like this, that would be a grade two because I've eliminated gravity in this situation. And then grade four is a little subjective. Uh, four plus means almost full power. Uh, four means that there's a loss of power. Four minus means it's just barely giving you some, uh, some power. So Aaron's strength there in the proximal muscles uh, was a grade four. Now we're just gonna check for sh some scapular winging. Put your arm forward and push up, push up, push up, push up and the scapula actually did come off the uh, back there. And you can feel it coming up, or if the patient uh, didn't have a gown on, you could see the scapula winging. We can see that in Pompe disease, we can see that in FSH dystrophy. So we do have some weakness there. Now let's take a look on this side, and just push straight up, push, 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 and there is some scapular winging there. So there's definitely proximal weakness. Now let's take a look distally. Can you squeeze my fingers? Strong as you can, strong. Oh, that's good and strong, okay. Now I'm gonna ask you now to squeeze strong, and let go as fast as you can. Let go, good. So her distal strength is totally normal and there was no myotonia. So there's things called myotonic dystrophy, which uh, I don't think you have. Type one would definitely show stiffness in the hands. And we'll just do one other quick check, spread your fingers apart, push, push, nice and strong, push. So distal myopathies or neuropathies would show weakness distally. Her strength is normal, but we're seeing some proximal weakness. Now let's turn our attention to the lower extremities and finish the motor exam. Bring your knee up. Can you get it up to my hand? Push, push. Okay, all right, let's try it on this side. Bring it up, push, push. So she can just barely get it up. So on this side, uh, she couldn't move through gravity, so that would be a two. On the left, she could move through gravity, that's a three. So clearly we have some weakness there. Now try and push your legs apart. Okay, that's nice and strong. That's abduction, taking away. Uh, bringing together is add, bringing it, adding it back to the body. Okay, okay, and you okay? So she clearly demonstrates some weakness with hip flexion and adduction, uh, but not abduction. And we often see that in different muscle disorders. And now we can take a look at the more distal muscles down here. So I can get you just to relax, pull the toes up, strong as you can, pull. Good, and that's nice and strong. And this one here, pull. So if we did see some weakness there, we would contest other muscles, but to a, a first approximation in a family medicine uh, office or internal medicine, those are really the main muscles that we would check. And what we see is definitely some proximal weakness, and we're going to just check a few other things. So the next part of the exam is the reflexes. We'll just take a look and let it go nice and loose. And this is the brachioradialis, and you can see how nice and perfect that is. So really that's all you need to do unless somebody had neck pain or a weakness on one side of the arm showing that the reflexes are normal. In the lower extremities here, let it go loose. And we still can generate a reflex. And we have reflexes nice and normal down here. Reflexes are zero if they're completely absent. Um, if we couldn't get it the first time, we can distract people. Um, and this is a grade one. So for example, if I couldn't get the reflex here, I could ask her to take your hands and pull them apart. And then if I could get the reflex, that would be a grade one. And that's called the Gendrasic maneuver. Um, but her reflexes are normal. In patients with muscle disease, if they're getting very weak, eventually you'll lose the knee reflex because the muscle is just too weak to generate a reflex. But uh, in clinical practice, we really only need to do the brachioradialis, knee jerks, and ankle jerks. Ankle jerks are lost early in neuropathy um, and lost late in myopathy in the knees. 
Sensory examination, um, Aaron told us that there was no problems at all with numbness or tingling, so we just are going to do a, a quick screen. Sometimes patients with muscle disease and other neurologic disorders can have deficiencies, things like vitamin D deficiency, vitamin B12, uh, or even prediabetes, uh, which can affect the nerves. So with a tuning fork, it has to be a 128, not a 256 uh, when you're testing this. So what we're going to do is just let your leg go loose. Do you feel the buzz down here? Yes. Good. Tell me when it stops. Stops. Okay. Perfectly normal. And we'll just check it here. Do you feel the buzz? Yes. Tell me when it stops. Stop. Perfectly normal. So we're just going to check um, sensation. Now she doesn't have any issues at all with numbness and tingling. So just a quick screen uh, can be as simple as taking your tuning fork, which is cold, touching it here. Does that feel cold? Cold. And cold up here? Cold. Yeah, so she can feel the cold there. So we're testing the two main sensory pathways. Pain and temperature is carried by one fiber, and vibration and proprioception is carried by another. So those are both perfectly normal. We would not expect those to be abnormal in a muscle disease, uh, so I don't believe that you have a nerve disease because usually these would be affected with a peripheral neuropathy. Okay. Now either with your tuning fork, um, you could do it here, or with your uh, reflex hammer, uh, you could also just scratch the toes and she has a bit of withdrawal response, but and if she had corticospinal tract issues, uh, the toe would go up. So for example, if there was a stroke uh, or a spinal cord problem, uh, and the toes will usually fan out, uh, but her toes were um, going like this, but not up, so that's normal. Um, usually they will stay the same or sometimes uh, curl down. Uh, the abnormal response is toe up and the toes fan out, and uh, you don't have any issues there at all. Okay. So um, what we've established is that there's definitely some proximal weakness there. You did tell us that it was hard sometimes to uh, get out of a chair, to get up from the ground, uh, and you said that your gait was off a bit too. So I think what we'll do now is just if you could sit in this chair, which is a little bit lower, and we'll just see how you get out of the chair and uh, take a few steps for me, please. Okay, so I'll have you sit there. Good, I'll just stand over here. And what I'd like you to do, uh, whenever you're comfortable, uh, just try and stand up the way you normally would at home. And then if you could just take a couple of steps for us. Okay, okay. go ahead. Okay, that's great. And then uh, we have you come back. And then just sit down. Okay, so that's, uh, that's the gate that people were talking about, is that correct? That's right. Okay, so what we saw is that getting up from a chair, because of the proximal weakness that we saw, uh, it was impossible to use the strength just to stand up. So Aaron, what you were doing is you had to put your hands down to compensate and uh, get yourself up from the chair. And because these muscles are weak here, when you're starting to walk, the hips are dropping a little bit and it's giving a bit more of a sway. Um, so looking at the complete package um, with the weakness that you've had, the muscle enzymes being elevated, uh, weakness in the shoulders and the hips, there's a variety of muscle disorders I think that we need to look into. I'm not seeing any toxins, uh, drugs that could have done this, uh, so we have to think about things that could be genetic. Um, you know, good news is most of these with your negative family history, uh, don't worry about your kids. Uh, usually these are things where your mom and dad would carry the bad gene. So things we're going to look into um, are limb girdle muscular dystrophies and a thing called Pompe disease. Um, Pompe disease can look like the limb girdle dystrophies um, and there is a specific treatment for that so that's why we want to uh, you know, really get the diagnosis for you and also I think important for you to know because once we have the di gene diagnosis, uh, prognosis, uh, family uh, risk and all of these things we can talk about but most importantly for you what can we do to help treat these things okay? Okay. Good. Thank Thanks. You.